sorry, I'm reading. It's not here today. She gave me this book, Best Doctor Jokes Ever. <laughs> so I'm going to read one of those. But first, um, I read an article that just drove me crazy. And Jack did too. It was the story of the proposed reparation in San Francisco. Uh, Five million dollars up front, a free house, no taxes, money for 250 years. So I wrote this letter, the protest started at 2.30 uh, at my front lawn, if you're, if you're interested. But the uh, letter is titled, Instant Millionaires, Suggested Reparation, Five million to every black adult Wednesday news story. Of all the insane liberal idea that I have heard, this one takes the cake, proposing to make all qualified black citizens instant millionaires. Living on easy street is totally absurd. People who were never slaves, being paid by people who never owned slaves, is ridiculous. My family members were made slaves in Russia by the communists. You've heard that story. I don't need to tell it again, but they actually took everything my family owned, made us, not me, thank God, my father, his father, his brothers worked for free and gave half of everything to the government. They took all their land, they took all their guns, they took all their money. And so I said, my family members were made slaves by the communists in Russia, so where's my dough? We need to thank God Almighty that we live in this country and stop looking for ways to grumble and complain and seek free grinds. So, I'm sure Black Lives Matter be at my house today. <laughs> All right, this one uh, I thought was good. A patient's family gathered at the hospital to hear what the specialist had to say about their beloved. Things don't look good, the doctor began. The only chance he has is with a brain transplant. Now you should know that this is an experimental procedure. It might work, it might not. Either way, brains are very expensive. And you would have to cover the cost on your own. Well, how much does the brain cost, piped up one relative? Well, a male brain is $500,000. A female brain is $200,000. Some of the younger male relatives tried to look shot, but the rest of them nodded, thinking they understood. A few actually smirked. But the patient's daughter was unsatisfied. Why the large difference in price between male brains and female brains, she asked. Well, it's a standard pricing practice, said the head of the team. Women's brains have to be marked down because they've actually been used. <laughs> so I... I, I like that one. And then this one. Mrs. Jones went to see her obstetrician. Dr. Smith, I'm pregnant again. And I need a hearing aid. Mrs. Jones, Dr. Smith said, I thought we decided the last time that 12 children were more than you could handle. You don't need a hearing aid. What you need is a more powerful contraceptive. Mrs. Jones insisted, but Dr. Smith, I don't need a contraceptive, I need a hearing aid. I don't understand, said Dr. Smith. 
Well, you see, doctor, replied Mrs. Jones, I'm kind of hard of hearing. At night, when the mister and I turn off the lights and go to bed, he asks me, do you want to go to sleep or what? And I always say, what? <laughs> Thanks to Irene. <laughs> Those are good. All right, if you take your outline, we're studying the Bible straight through. And the picture we have on the cover is of a man being cured of leprosy. Um, he's actually the head of the Syrian army. But what we learned last week is all about Elisha. Um, Elisha asked God to miraculously supply water to the combined forces of Judah and Israel in their attack against the Moabites. God answers his prayer. He is in the miracle business. And then Elisha operating in a double dose of Elijah's spirit performs miracle after miracle, blessing families with provision. Always be grateful for your blessings. Count them one by one as the song goes. And finally, Elisha, thankful for the hospitality of a family, has God bless her with a son whom he later raises from the dead. And we studied last week that seven people in scripture were raised from the dead six of which eventually died again one was risen permanently and that's the lord jesus christ the first fruits of the resurrection and then he also feeds people like what jesus did with a small amount of food given to over a hundred people and that's in Luke. And then page two. Great state of Idaho. I read where part of Washington wants to leave the state of Washington and become part of Idaho. And you can see why. They're all Republicans that are running the state. And then the scripture, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's anything wicked in me. I love David's Psalms. He was a man after God's own heart and lead me in the everlasting. You know, the 23rd Psalm, the famous Psalm, David says, he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Anyone that follows Christ, God, should have a good reputation. You should follow paths of righteousness. And that reflects on your relationship with God. And then where we are, we're going to study chapters 5 and 6 today. Elisha set up his base on Mount Carmel. And that's where Elisha executed those 850 prophets of Baal. And he's blessed by a double portion of the Holy Spirit, and nothing is too hard for God. This includes directing a crushing defeat of the Moabites, an immaculate conception, and the healing of a kind woman's son, purifying poisonous food. Claudia, you ought to have Denny study that. <laughs> Denny's not feeling too good today. Uh, and feeding a crowd with very little. So chapter uh, five. Now Israel and Syria have a very strange relationship. It's times of war, times of peace. Sometimes they do business together, but Naaman is the head of the commander of the army of the king of Syria. They're at peace right now. And he says he's a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. That's the king of Syria, ben Hadad. And the Lord had given him victory. He was a mighty man of valor, but he has leprosy. And leprosy is still 
a problem today. I didn't realize there's over 2 million people with leprosy today. And it's a terrible disease. Your skin turns white. It causes nerve damage. It uh, eventually causes organ failure. It is communicable, but not like COVID. I mean, you really have to be around somebody uh, a lot to catch leprosy from them. But the Syrians uh, had gone out on a raid and they brought back a young girl from the land of Israel and she waited on Naaman's wife. And apparently he was a good person to her as well. And she says, you know, if only Naaman could uh, meet with the prophet Elisha, who's in Samaria, he would heal him of this leprosy. So Naaman went and told the king what uh, uh, Roaring Lambs is calling, uh, told the king, and the king said, I tell you what, I'll write the king of Israel and I'll send him a letter to get you taken care of. So he departed, took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold. He's coming loaded and 10 changes of clothing. I guess new clothes was a very nice luxury back then. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. And he said, be advised when this letter arrives that you take care of Naaman, my servant, that you heal him from this leprosy. Well, the king reads this and thinks, I can't heal him. I don't have that, that ability. Am I God to make him alive? And he sends me to heal this guy of leprosy. I think he's seeking a quarrel with me. I think he wants to start a little trouble between Israel and Syria. So it was when Elisha heard it that the king had rent his clothes. Whenever they were upset, they would rend their clothes. They would tear them, and the king did this. And Elisha said, hey, don't worry. Send him to me. He'll know that there is a prophet of the Lord God Almighty in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and came to Elisha's house. Now Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He sends one of his servants and he tells him this message. He says, go wash in the Jordan River seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you'll be clean of leprosy. Now, Naaman is insulted that Elisha didn't come to the door and he has him do something mundane like go wash in the Jordan River. So Naaman becomes furious and stomps off and said, you know, I thought he would come out, wave his hands to his God and heal me on the spot. Aren't there nicer rivers in Damascus? The Abana and the Farpar, I could have bathed in those. So he turned away in rage. But one of his wise servants that was with him came near and said, look, if the prophet had told you to do something dramatic, something great, wouldn't you have done it right away? How much more should you obey these strange commands that have to wash in the Jordan, but do it. So he went to the river and he washed himself seven times and the flesh was restored. He was healed like the flesh of a little child, fresh and new and clean. And he came back to the man of God and all his aides were surrounding him and he stood before Elisha and he said, I have a profession of faith here. I know that there is no God in all the earth that could have done this except your God, the God of Israel. Therefore, please 
take some of this money and gifts that I want to give you as a thank you. Well, Elisha's pure. He is a holy man. And he said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I don't want your money. I won't take anything. And he, Naaman urged him and urged him to take it. He said, no, I refuse. I'm not going to take bribes to do the God's work. So Naaman said, well, if not, please do this for me. Give me two mule loads of this earth in Israel. And I'm going to sacrifice from now on to your God. I'm not going to offer any burnt offering to the pagan gods of Syria at the temple of Rimmon. Rimmon was the Syrian pagan god to worship there. But I've got a little problem. I work for the king, and the king has me go with him to these services. Would God please forgive me if I go to this temple, not to worship, just to help the king? Would the Lord please pardon me in this thing? And Elisha said to him, Fine, go in peace. Because God knows your heart. He doesn't need your lip service. He needs your heart. So he departed and he starts heading back to Syria. Now, Gehazi is Elisha's right hand man. He's his, he's his number one servant. And he thinks to himself, hmm, my master spared Naaman this Syrian. He didn't take anything that he brought him. But as the Lord lives, here is my idea. I'm going to run after him. And I'm going to get some of that money for myself. So Gehazi pursues Naaman. He's running after him. Hey, wait. And when Naaman saw him running, he turned off his chariot. He said, hey, is everything okay? He said, yeah, everything's fine, but I'm going to tell you a big lie right now. <laughs> he said, uh, hey, two young men of the sons of the prophets came to our house unannounced, and they came from the mountain. Would you be so nice as to give a talent of silver? Now, a talent was 70 pounds, okay, and two changes of clothes. For these guys and Naaman graciously said sure hey take two talents I'll give you I'll give you I brought it all for Elisha anyway and he urged him to take two talents and he handed them over and they carried him back to his house and when he came to the citadel he took uh, this money and new clothes and he hid them in his house and he let the men go and they departed and he went in to check on Elisha and Elisha says where have you been <laughs> Gehazi and I wrote my bible uh oh <laughs> here it comes did not my heart go with you I knew exactly what you did God has told me what you have done Gehazi has a time to re receive money and clothes and other gifts, vineyards, sheep, female servants. Therefore, we're not in the business of making money. We're in the business of promoting our Heavenly Father. And he said, therefore, Gehazi, guess what? The leprosy of Naaman that I just cured him of is going to cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous as white as snow. So Gehazi proved that stealing and lying is not a good thing. 
So he gets it. Now this next story, I heard about before, I hadn't really studied it, but the floating axe head. And this just tells me that God's concerned with all aspects of our life, even if it seems insignificant. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, hey, the place that we're all living here together is way too small. Let's go down to Jordan and every man will cut down a tree, take a beam, and let us build a nice house that we can all fit in. So he said, go ahead. But they said, wait a minute, you're an awfully good luck charm. I want you to go with us. So he said, would you go? And he said, I'll go with you. So they went and they came to the Jordan and they're cutting down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron ax head fell into the river fell into the water, and of course, the iron tends to sink quickly. And he cried out and said, oh no, I borrowed this ax head. And ax heads back then were very valuable. They were expensive, and so it sinks to the bottom. So Elisha says, where did it fall in? And he showed him the place where it had fallen in to the river. So he cut off a stick and he threw it into that spot and guess what bubbled up to the surface? The ax head. And he said, pick it up. So he reached out and he picked up the floating ax head. It's an interesting little segue in the scripture because one of the reasons I know the Bible is true is that it doesn't pull any punches. It tells you like it was and is. And things don't change very much in 3,000 years. People are still people. And so we all need God. Now, blinded Syrians captured. These are very fickle times with Israel and Syria. And the king of Syria, he's trying to make war with Israel. And he consulted with his servants and said, all right, here's our battle plan. We'll have this group here, this group there. And the man of God, Elisha, sent to the king of Israel saying, beware, the king of Syria is setting up shop in these areas and they're all down there. And the king of Israel sent out some spies and they said, he's right, they are there. And he said, they were watchful just not once or twice, but all the time. So it was like, you know, they had uh, supernatural protection knowing where these people were. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was troubled. He was mad. He thinks there's traitors amongst them that are giving this information to the king of Israel. One of his servants said, look, none of us are traitors, but it's that prophet Elisha. He knows what's going on, and he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom in private. But he's talking about war plans, not what he's telling his, his wives, but he's talking about what's happening militarily. So he said, let's go see where he is, that I may get him. I want to know where Elisha is. I got to put a stop to this. And they said, surely he is in Dothan. And I wrote, what's he doing in Alabama? Right? <laughs> Dothan is 12 miles north of Samaria. An interesting tidbit is that's the same town where Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. So it was a cross uh, traffic there. So therefore he sent horses and chariots and sent some raiders to come and get Elisha. And the servant of the man of God arose early 
and looked around and he sees all these Syrian soldiers around the city with horses and chariots. And he wakes Elisha up and says, Alas, my master, what are we going to do? We're surrounded here. And so he answered, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And the servants go, on, what are you talking about? And it's you and me and a few people. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. And the Lord opened his eyes and he saw the angelic host. All around the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire just like the ones that picked up Elijah so he's seeing this angelic host and I wrote my Bible greater is he who is within us than who is within the world that's the devil greater is Christ within us and so when the Syrians decided to come down and attack Elisha praised the Lord Lord strike them all blind make every one of them blind and so they're stumbling around and Elisha said to him hey follow me and I'll take you who you're looking for so they follow him 12 miles to Samaria they don't know where they're going they're all blind and so he led them to Samaria and then when he came to Samaria Elisha said Open her eyes now so they can see. <clears throat> and they opened up and they saw they were inside Syria. Well, Syria, I mean, Samaria. They had a lot of army because that's the capital city of Israel, Samaria, at this time. And he said, uh, the king said to Elisha, he calls him my father. So he was his spiritual father and trying to do a good job. He said, should I kill them? Should I kill them all? And Elisha said, no, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those you've already captured? You've already taken them captive? Tell you what, let's feed them. They just walked 12 miles, set some food and water that they can eat and drink and go back home to Syria and he prepared a great meal they ate and drank and they sent them away and these bands of raiders never came back and I wrote down kindness can lead to repentance in fact God's kindness can lead us to repentance as well <coughs> this next chapter was very tough for me to read and it will be for you but Syria now has brought the full force of their army <coughs> to Samaria and they besieged it and this is going to happen to Jerusalem with the Babylonians uh, it's going to be a terrible time of famine they surrounded it to where they couldn't get food, they couldn't get in or out. And the Bible says a donkey's, the famine was so bad that a donkey's head went for 80 shekels of silver. So inflation and a little thing of dove droppings. Now, I, I don't know what they did with dove droppings. I, I made pies out of them. I don't know what they did. But uh, those sold for five shekels, dove dropping. And as the king of Israel, this is Jehoram, <coughs> this is Ahab and Jezebel's son, was passing by the wall. And this woman is just pleading for help. Help me, O oh king, help me. He said, hey, if God can't help you, what can I do? We don't have any food. There's no food on the threshing floor. There's no wine in the wine press. But the king said, what's, what's troubling you so badly? 
And she answered, this woman, <coughs> this friend of hers, this woman said, give your son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So they have resorted to cannibalism. Just a terrible thing. So we boiled my son. Now, I don't know how big her son was. Probably a small child, I would guess. And we ate him. And I said to her on the next day, Now give me your son, and we'll eat him this day. But she hit him. She bailed. She ate my son. I don't have her son. And I'm unbelievably distressed. Now it happened when the king heard this story. It affected him greatly. And again, he tears his clothes as he passed by the walls. The people looked and he was wearing sackcloth. So he was in mourning already because of this famine. He was wanting to repent because this was a judgment from God. And he said, God do to me and more also. They always say that when they want to make a point. If the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today, this is all Elisha's fault and I'm going to execute him today. So, Elisha is sitting in his house with the other elders and prophets with him. And the king sent a man ahead of him. So he wants to find Elisha and then come and execute him. But before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, Do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Now, he's talking about Ahab and Jezebel because they murdered all the prophets of God. And that's why Elisha took the revenge of his deal on the prophets of Baal. But here's what we do. When the messenger comes, shut the door and hang on to him, hold him fast, because the king's going to be right behind him, and I want to talk to the king directly. And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger. He came down, and the king said, Surely this calamity is from the Lord. I hate the Lord. I'm not going to wait on him any longer. I'm going to take matters into my own hands and I'm going to kill Elisha and put a stop to all this judgment. Well, that's not exactly what happens. And we'll study that next week. But the three takeaways I put, um, God uses a powerful man, Naaman, cured with leprosy, and a young girl to display his mercy and healing ability, but Naaman's got to follow his commandments to receive that blessing. And Naaman thought he could buy it. He had to obey it. And I wrote down, obedience is better than sacrifice. And we studied that back in 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verse 22. And that's where uh, Saul is debating with Samuel about following God's commandments. Because Saul had taken a bunch of uh, booty and was going to sacrifice to God. But he spared the king, Agag, and he didn't follow the instructions. So Samuel said in verse 22, Has the Lord 
as great a delight in burned offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. You know, it's kind of like uh, the old Soprano show, you know, they'd, they'd kill somebody, but they'd write a big check to the church that week, you know, thinking that's going to take care of it. Well, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams, than giving any kind of money is not as important as obeying God's commandments. And then in verse 23 says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So that was back in 1 Samuel, the prophet Samuel talking to King Saul. And then Elisha refuses to take compensation from the thankful Naaman. He only wants him to worship the true God, Jehovah, not Rimmon, the Syrian pagan God. His greedy, lying servant, Gehazi, is punished with leprosy for his deceit. And then three, God supernaturally preserves Israel in conflicts with the Syrians. During times of great distress and famine, miracle after miracle occurs through Elisha. He is hated now for his guiding of Israel and the king of Syria wants him eliminated. So that's our lesson for today. Uh, next week we'll study chapters 7 and 8, and hopefully my sign will stay up here. Debbie, use that alien tape next time. <laughs> well, we'll open it up if you have a question or comment, Jim. It's just a guess, but I'm assuming that that dropping is an indication of the price of fuel that got up quite a bit. That that could very well be. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they ate them. I think they burned them. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's amazing what uh, what terrible times can come from uh, sieges of cities. Uh, the siege of Jerusalem, which we'll study later, lasted for years. They actually had to build ramps up to the top of the city so they could take it because it was a walled city, fortified city. But it's uh, it's a terrible thing. War is hell, right, Ken? How's your hat? Looks sharp. <laughs> I was just thinking my mother had this saying. It was the acronym HALT, C-J-L-T. And she said, and be careful when you're too hungry, too angry, too lonely too tired very good because you will find yourself any human being doing what you can do but what i thought was interesting about what you read was parents usually protect their children so if anybody's going to die it would be you these people are going to boil and eat their own children they eat their own young in order to live um, and you know you focus on the eating part but truthfully the heart of an individual that would say, excuse me, I ate my child now, tomorrow we're going to eat yours, but we serve our children up today, all of us, not collectively in this room, but I mean in general, yep. in our society, in this woke society that we're in, we, we, yeah, it's we to the God our of, children to be eaten alive by things that are yeah. so filthy and diabolical Great. in order to preserve ourselves because we're too weak to stand up for Great something. comparison. It's the, the sacrifice them to the God of convenience. You know, it's... Uh, I think I would kill myself before I would eat my kid. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. I, that's why I know this scripture is true, because that wouldn't be in the Bible I wrote. I don't know, I wouldn't have put that in there. Anyone else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word, and we're grateful for the lessons that we see all through scripture. That's why it's so important to read each book of the Bible is there for a reason. 
and it gives us the direction for life. It gives us the hope of the future. And Lord Jesus, we're so grateful. Grateful that you're the first fruits of the resurrection and that we have the hope of an eternity with you in paradise that we can get through anything in this life. Thank you for the many blessings. We do want to be grateful and thankful, and we love you, Lord, and we appreciate all that you do in our lives. And we give you all the glory and praise in Christ's name. Amen. But we'll see you next week. I am a